This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can pre-order all the cards in this video by using the link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nietzsche Hone, and I'm continuing today with my Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth limited set review. So far I've looked at all the multicolored, colorless, and white cards, and today we're continuing with blue. For each of these cards I'll discuss how I think they'll play in limited, and I'll sum up my thoughts by using a letter grade. If you're new to my set reviews, you can find out what my grades mean by looking in the description. A couple of things to keep in mind as we look at these cards. I'm only evaluating these for play in limited and not in any other formats, and these are my evaluations of these cards before actually playing with them, so I of course won't be right about everything. I will be providing updates here on the channel as I play the format. Additionally, only cards that appear in draft boosters are going to be reviewed in this video. Lastly, I want to let you know that I'm offering some set review related perks for both patrons and channel members. You get access to my ongoing notes during preview season, and by the end of the set review, you'll have a spreadsheet with all of my grades. If those perks sound interesting to you and you want to support the channel, you can find ways to become a channel member or a patron in the description. All right, without further ado, let's look at the first blue card in my Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth limited set review. First up, it's Arwen's Gift, which for three generic and a blue is a common sorcery. It costs one less to cast if you control two or more legendary creatures, and you scry two, then draw two cards. Having two legendary creatures in play is way more doable in this set than it is in most, but you also shouldn't always expect to be able to cast this for three. At 4 mana, it is definitely a little bit clunky, but at least you can see up to 4 cards, which is a lot in limited. Casting it for 3 is a lot better, because at that point it's a better divination. Still, I don't think it'll be so easy to cast it for 3 that it's any better than a C. And you probably don't really want more than one of them anyway, even with Scry being a central theme. You just can't have that many cards in your deck that don't impact the board. Next up, it's the Bath Song, which for three generic and a blue is an uncommon enchantment saga. Chapter 1 and 2, you draw two cards and discard a card. Chapter 3, shuffle any number of target cards from your graveyard into your library, add two blue mana. I don't love that none of what this does impacts the board at all, and that's a pretty big liability when you're paying four mana. Sure, it does net you a couple of cards and then give you some mana, but I'm not sure that's enough for me to think this is good. It does trigger the cards in the set that like it when you draw extra cards, which are especially prevalent in blue-white, and sometimes you'll have something that this mana helps you cast. There is some value in shuffling a bunch of non-lands back into your deck, both keeping you from decking and improving your spell density, but this is expensive enough and slow enough that I'm just not super impressed. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Bewitching Leechcraft, which for one generic and a blue is a common enchantment aura with enchant creature. When it enters the battlefield, tap enchanted creature. Enchanted creature has, if this creature would untap during your untap step, remove a plus one plus one counter from it instead. If you do, untap it. Otherwise, it doesn't untap. This is an interesting design. Obviously, this doesn't work very well against armies, since they will have counters to remove that allows this to untap. And there are other plus one plus one counters in the set as well, but I think this will effectively lock down most creatures in the set. And it isn't like if they have plus one plus one counters, this goes away entirely because they have to keep removing counters in order to untap it. Obviously, you want to use it on things that don't have counters at all. I'm just saying that even in the worst case, it can be a problem. I think this actually gets pretty close to being premium removal because it's so cheap, but even ignoring the whole plus and plus one counter downside of the card, this doesn't ever fully deal with a creature. If it has a static ability or an activated ability, this won't be stopping those. It's also weak against bounce effects, flicker effects, the same things that enchantment removal always have a problem against. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, it's Bill Fernie, Bree Swindler, which for one generic and a blue is a 2-1 legendary creature, human rogue, and uncommon. When it becomes blocked, choose one, create a treasure token, target opponent gains control of target horse you control. If they do, remove Bill Fernie from combat and create three treasure tokens. So the horse effect is mostly here for some hilarious flavor. There are some horses in the set, but this is mostly just a 2-mana two 2-1 two that makes a treasure when it gets blocked. That's a fairly mediocre 2-drop, but not a disaster either, I'm giving it a C-. Next up, it's Birthday Escape, which for one blue mana is a common sorcery. It says, draw a card, the ring tempts you. This is especially attractive in the spell deck and the draw 2 deck. 
but one blue to draw a card and get tempted actually seems like a fine rate in general. I'm giving this a C, and I could see this ending up being even better when you're only spending one mana for something, and it does two things. That has panned out pretty well in Limited lately. Next up, I have Born Upon a Wind, which for one generic and a blue is a rare instant. You may cast spells this turn as though they had flash, draw a card. This replaces itself, so it's hard for it to be terrible, but paying two mana to give your spells flash normally isn't going to be that big of a deal, because you need to cast this, and then you have to have mana available to cast your non-instants for the effect to actually matter. And having that all line up consistently and limited isn't something you should expect to happen all the time. Still, it does have upside in the worst cases that you pay two to draw a card, so it's certainly not terrible, I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Captain of Umber, which for two generic and a blue is a 2-3 human pirate at common. You can pay one generic and tap it to draw a card and then discard a card. This has below rate stats, but looting for one mana isn't too bad, especially in a format with lots of payoffs for drawing an extra card. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Council's Deliberation, which for one generic and a blue is an uncommon instant. It says draw a card. Whenever you scry, if you control an island, you may exile Council's Deliberation from your graveyard. If you do, draw a card. This is a neat take on Think Twice and similar cards. Drawing a card for two mana isn't really worth it, but if you have a few cards with scry in your deck, this suddenly turns into an impressive two for one that you only spend two mana on. Scry is definitely available in the set too, and it's very doable to make this work in most blue decks. I think this ends up being amazingly efficient for what it gives you. I'm giving it a B minus. Next up, it's Deceive the Messenger, which for one blue mana is a common instant. Target creature gets minus three, minus zero until end of turn, a mass orcs one. This means you put a plus one, plus one counter in an army you control. It's also an orc. If you don't control an army, create a zero, zero black orc army creature token first. Instants that temporarily lower power usually aren't very good, since they aren't usually enough to help your creature win in combat or something like that. Instead, they just feel like they delay the inevitable, which definitely isn't worth a card. But adding a mass to the mix does matter. If you think of this as a 1-mana one 1-1 one, one that gives a creature minus 3, minus 0 until end of turn, that sounds pretty reasonable. It won't always be that, but if it isn't, then it's putting a counter on your army, and that does increase the chances of this actually feeling like a combat trick. It's still nothing special, but normally this kind of card is a D, but I think a mass is enough for this to be a C. Next up, it's Dreadful as the Storm, which for two generic and a blue is a common instant. Target creature has base power and toughness 5-5 five, five until end of turn, the ring tempts you. I don't think this is very good. Lately, we've been seeing cards with this type of effect actually be playable for the first time, but that's because they've been adding draw a card to them. Once that's the case, a boost like this can be a two for one, and that's a big deal. The ring tempting you isn't nearly as good as drawing you a card, so I don't think this does enough. The problem with this type of boost is that you end up overpaying for it on a lot of your creatures. Like, imagine using this on a 3-3. That means you're just getting plus two, plus two, and that's not worth three mana. Sure, on one ones it feels better, for example, but that makes this overly situational. I think it's just a D. Next up, it's Elrond, Lord of Rivendell, which for two generic and a blue is a 3-2 legendary elf noble at uncommon. When Elrond or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. If this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn, the ring tempts you. A 3-mana three 3-2 three that scries one when it enters isn't terrible, and adding scry one to all of your creatures is a pretty nice deal. Triggering it more than once in a turn isn't impossible either, so I think you can expect if he sticks around that the ring will tempt you at least once. And all of that seems like a lot of value to have on a three mana card. I'm giving him a B minus. Next up, it's Gandalf, friend of the Shire, which for three generic and a blue is a 2-4 legendary avatar wizard at Uncommon. He's got flash. You may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. And when the ring tempts you, if you chose a creature other than Gandalf, friend of the Shire, as your ring bearer, draw a card. So just to remind you, as I probably should have done earlier in the video, when the ring tempts you, that means you get an emblem called the ring. When that happens, you select a ring bearer, and your ring bearer gets the bonuses that you've unlocked on the ring, and each time the ring tempts you, you get the next bonus down on the card. And every time the ring tempts you, you can choose a ring bearer, but you can only have one ring bearer at a time. So a 4-mana 2-4 with flash and the ability to turn your sorceries into instants isn't bad, but what really makes this impressive is the fact that you get to draw a card every time you choose not Gandalf as your ring bearer. That's pretty big value. I mean, drawing a whole card is a big deal, especially because you're already getting the ring tempts you value. And even if you only draw one card with Gandalf the whole time he's around, that's going to feel pretty amazing, giving him a B-. 
Next up, it's Glorious Gale, which for one generic and a blue is a common instant counter-target creature spell if it was a legendary spell the ring tempts you. This is a strictly better Essence Scatter, and Essence Scatter is always solid and limited. It's cheap and counters the most common type of spell in your typical game. It is still a counter spell. Sometimes people make the mistake of sort of looking at counter magic as removal. In a lot of ways, it's worse because you have to have your mana up at the exact right time to remove the creature that you want to remove, whereas with other removal, that's not the case. But still, Essence Scatter ends up being fine and limited because it's easy to cast. You don't have to go out of your way to leave a bunch of mana up to counter things. And, you know, this has that extra ring tempts you upside. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Goldberry, River Daughter, which for one generic and a blue is a legendary nymph at rare. She's a 1-3. You can tap her to move a counter of each kind not on Goldberry, River Daughter from another target permanent you control onto Goldberry, and you can pay one blue and tap her to move one or more counters from Goldberry onto another target permanent you control if you do draw a card. If you have some counters around, she can be a pretty cool value engine. Moving counters to her is nice, especially if you can get a plus and plus one counter from one of your armies or something, but her ability to move counters from herself to other stuff while drawing you cards is what really intrigues me. Unfortunately, you end up having to have the right board state and the right amount of time to use both of those activated abilities before she really starts delivering, and that seems like a pretty big ask. You could start by putting the counters on her first, that's probably the way you generate the most value, and that will certainly work, but it does seem tricky to always get the full value you're going to want out of her. Still, she has a passable baseline, and if you have enough counters, she's going to be pretty nice. But she's probably never going to be amazing because she's so slow, giving her a C+. Next up, it's Greyhaven's Navigator, which for two generic and a blue is a 3-2 elf pilot at common. It's got flash. When it enters the battlefield, scry one. We've seen three mana 3-2s with flash and scry a lot lately, I feel like, and they haven't been that good, but... In the other sets, there wasn't a scry deck like there is in this one. That probably does enough for this to be fine, giving it a C. Next up, it's Hithlaian Knots, which for one generic and a blue is a common instant. Tap target creature, scry one, draw a card. This does a bunch of little stuff that will play reasonably well in multiple decks in the format. Whether you're interested in drawing extra cards in blue-white, casting spells in blue-red, or scrying in blue-green, this has you covered. Tapping a creature isn't a big effect, but if you're getting some sort of payoff for casting this, on top of that it tends to feel fine, and that's what'll happen in those decks. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Horses of the Bruinen, which for three generic and two blue is an uncommon sorcery. Return up to two target creatures to their owner's hands. Scry one, the ring tempts you. I don't like this. We've seen lots of cards like this, and you usually go down a card when you cast this without taking any cards away from your opponent. You get some tempo, provided you bounce things that are expensive enough, but that is far from guaranteed. This can bounce armies, which might feel pretty good when the army is particularly large, but overall this doesn't feel like it can consistently give you what it needs to pay you back for using up a card and spending five mana, giving it a D. Next up, it's Yoreth of the Healing House, which for two generic and a blue is a 1-4 legendary human cleric and uncommon. You can tap her and untap another target permanent or tap her and untap two other target legendary creatures. The best use for this is going to be to ramp your mana, but the ability to untap permanents has lots of other upsides too, and the fact she can untap two legendary creatures will have its uses sometimes. She's also got semi-decent defensive stats, giving her a B minus. Next up, it's Isolation at Orthonk, which for three generic and a blue is a common instant. Put target creature into its owner's library second from the top. This is nice blue removal. You always trade one for one with it, at least. And because it's an instant, sometimes you'll be able to really get your opponent if you cast it in response to a trick. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, it's Ethelian Kingfisher, which for two generic and a blue is a common 2-1 bird. It's got flying. When it dies, you draw a card. This isn't quite as good as a 3-mana 2-1 with flying that draws a card when it enters the battlefield. We've seen a few of those lately, but it's still pretty good. It's a reasonable threat in the air, and it can deliver a 2-for-1 pretty often. I'm giving it a C+. Next, it's Knights of Dol Amroth, which for 3 generic and a blue is a 3-3 human knight at common. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, put a plus and plus one counter in Knights of Dol Amroth. We've seen this card before by a different name, and it was pretty underwhelming, even in a set where drawing a second card was like supposed to be a thing. Starting out as a hill giant is pretty rough these days, and even in a deck built around drawing extra cards, getting this to 4-4 four, four just won't always happen. And even if it does, you don't really feel like you're getting there with that first counter. You kind of need two. I'm giving it a C-. 
Next up, it's Lorien Revealed, which for three generic and a blue is a common sorcery. Draw three cards and has Island Cycling 1. That means you could pay one and discard it. Search your library for an island and put it into your hand. Five mana to draw three at sorcery speed is, in most formats, a little too clunky to be something every deck wants. But the fact this can Island Cycle earlier in the game helps make up for that by a fairly significant amount because that means it has a use even in situations where you don't have the time to cast it or you don't have the mana. Then when you do have time to cast this, the card advantage it can give you is pretty sweet. You just have to make sure you use it at a time where tapping out and not adding to the board at all is going to kill you, and there are a lot of those. Giving this a C. Next up, it's Lost Isle Calling, which for one generic and a blue is a rare enchantment. Whenever you scry, put a verse counter on Lost Isle Calling. You can pay four generic and two blue and exile it to draw a card for each verse counter on it. If it had seven or more verse counters on it, take an extra turn after this one. Activate only as a sorcery. I'm pretty high on the scry deck in this format, but even with that in mind, I don't like this very much. Actually getting cards out of it is going to take a very long time because you have to build up counters and then pay six mana. Obviously, if you find yourself able to get up to seven counters, you not only basically reload your hand, you also get a time walk in. That's crazy if you can pull it off, but the issue is that pulling it off is going to take way too long. And in the meantime, this does stone nothing. I'm giving it an F. Next up, it's Meneldor, Swift Savior, which for three generic and a blue is a 3-3 legendary bird soldier at Uncommon. It's got flying. When it deals combat damage to a player, exile up to one target creature you own, then return it to the battlefield under your control. A 4-mana 3-3 flyer is still a pretty good rate, and at worst, this can exile itself when it hits your opponent, which also effectively gives it vigilance. Obviously, you can get more value out of it by blinking things with Enter the Battlefield abilities and stuff, but the baseline here is already pretty nice giving it a B minus. Next up, it's Nimrodel Watcher, which for one generic and a blue is a 2-1 elf scout at common. When you scry, it gets plus one plus zero until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. This ability triggers only once each turn. This is a nice common payoff for scrying. There seems to be a critical mass of scry at lower rarities, so imagining that you can get in with this as an unblockable 3-1 a couple of times isn't crazy. Sometimes it'll even be a win condition. I'm giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Peller Gear Survivor, which for one generic and a blue is a 1-3 human peasant at common. You can tap it to add one mana of any color, spend that mana only to cast an instant or sorcery spell, and you can pay five generic and a blue and tap it to mill a player three cards. Fixing and ramp for spells is all right, though even in a spell heavy deck, this effect always seems to underperform. The other ability is even less meaningful. It costs a ton of mana and won't do something most of the time. You know, a mill effect that you use on your opponent really doesn't mean anything until your opponent's out of cards. Up until then, you end up spending all this mana to not affect the board at all. Maybe if you're milling yourself with it, it gets a little more interesting because you have some graveyard payoffs, but the amount of mana this costs and the minimal effect that it gives you is just not good. I'm giving this a C-. minus. Next, it's Press the Enemy, which costs two generic and two blue. It's a rare instant. It says return target spell or non-land permanent opponent controls to its owner's hand. You may cast an instant or sorcery spell with equal or less of mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost. The ability to bounce a spell off of the stack or a non-land permanent is decent, but not great for four mana. This is because this is another card where you go down a card in exchange for tempo, and that's often not a good idea in Limited. The flexibility makes up for that some, but for this to really feel good, you probably want to be casting something from your hand. Keep in mind, even when you do that, you aren't gaining a card of value, though you are generating some additional tempo. The bad news is you won't even always be able to pull that off, especially because it's restricted to instants and sorceries, and it has to have the right mana value. So overall, this seems pretty underwhelming for limited, at least for a rare. I think it's just a C. Next up, it's Rangers of Ethelion, which for two generic and two blue is a 3-3 human ranger at rare. It's got Vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, you gain control of up to one target creature with lesser power for as long as you control Rangers of Ethelion. Then the ring tempts you. Mind control effects are always really strong, even one like this that's a little restrictive. If you pay four mana and get this 3-3 with Vigilance, still your opponent's two drop, and the ring tempts you, you're going to get a ton of value for four mana. Sure, you don't necessarily keep the creature forever, but the turn you play this, it will almost always do a ton, and if your opponent can't deal with the rangers quickly, they probably lose. This is a bomb. I'm giving it an A-. Next up, it's Saruman the White. For four generic and a white, it's a 4-4 legendary avatar wizard at uncommon. It's got ward two, and whenever you cast your second spell each turn, you amass orcs too. 
I don't love the stat line, even with Ward 2, but getting to amass when you cast a second spell is pretty nice. If you only do it once, you're going to feel like you're getting reasonable value, and if you can make it happen more than once, it's going to feel quite good. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, it's Saruman's Trickery. For one generic and two blue, it's an uncommon instant. Counter target spell, amass orcs one. Cancel is usually a borderline playable, and that's what this is with upside because it comes with amass. That does make a significant difference because you'll be adding to the board and countering something, and that feels really good. That said, you still need to have mana up at the right time, and if your opponent can play around it, that can be pretty rough. Double blue matters too because with counter magic, Again, you have to have mana up at the exact right time, and the more challenging a mana value is for you to have to cast your counter magic, the harder it is for you to leave this up at the right time. Still, the more I think of this as a 3-mana 1-1 one, one that counters a spell, the more I like it. Obviously, that's not what it will always be, but that's what it's going to feel like a significant chunk of the time. I think it's a C+. Next up, it's Scroll of Isildur, which for two generic and a blue is a rare enchantment saga. Chapter 1 says, Gain control of up to one target artifact for as long as you control Scroll of Isildur. The ring tempts you. Chapter 2 says, Tap up to two target creatures, put a stun counter on each of them. And Chapter 3 says, Draw a card for each tap creature target opponent controls. Chapter 1 won't always have a target. When it does, it's going to feel pretty amazing to temporarily steal an artifact, almost no matter what it is. And you also get tempted by the ring. That's sort of the fail case. And that means chapter one at least does something. Chapter two isn't always going to be that meaningful. But if you're ahead, it's probably going to help you attack your opponent more effectively. And if you're behind, it will probably slow your opponent's roll. And then, because you've stunned those creatures, chapter three is going to draw you at least two cards. So I think this actually delivers a ton of value for three mana. Sure, it takes a while, like all sagas do. But if you think about everything this is giving you, it's really doing a lot for you for very little mana. And chapter one and two can both have significant impacts on the game. And usually they're gonna have at least a small impact on the game. Then those extra cards you draw with chapter three are probably going to pull you ahead all the way. In situations where chapter one actually lets you steal an artifact, this probably feels like a bomb, but you're not going to do it often enough for this to quite get a grade like that. But I think it's pretty good giving it a B plus. Next up, it's Soothing of Smeagol, which for one generic and a blue is a common instant. Return target non-token creature to its owner's hand. The ring tempts you. Two mana to bounce a non-token creature isn't an amazing deal these days. Remember, this is another instance where you're getting tempo and actually going down a card. But because this is an instant, sometimes you can use it in response to a trick or whatever, and then you get tempo and you take a card, and that feels pretty good. This does allow you to impact the board, and getting tempted by the ring is never a bad thing. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Stern Scolding, which for one blue mana is an uncommon instant. Counter target creature spell with power or toughness two or less. This is here for constructed formats. It's probably too narrow to ever be worth including in a limited deck. It just won't have enough targets. There may be a corner case where your opponent has so many creatures that have two power or two toughness that you sight it in, but I think it's safer to just say it's an F. Next up, it's Storm of Saruman, which for four generic and two blue is a mythic rare enchantment with Ward 3. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, copy it, except the copy isn't legendary. You may choose new targets for the copy. I don't like that this doesn't do anything initially, and you spent six mana and it didn't do anything, and then you aren't even guaranteed to be able to cast two spells in the same turn on your next turn. So this is too clunky and too finicky. I think it's probably an F. Next up, it's Surrounded by Orcs, which for three generic and a blue is a common sorcery. Amass Orcs three, then target player mills X cards, where X is the amassed army's power. So this is either a four mana three three that mills three, or it makes an army you have already larger, while milling even more. Neither of those are amazing, but if you're doing graveyard stuff or your opponent is low on cards, you can find yourself getting some real value out of this in addition to the amass, I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Treason of Isengard, which for two generic and a blue is a common sorcery. Put up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library, amass orcs too. A three mana two two that puts a spell on top of your library is an okay card. This is an effect players often overrate as they imagine getting back a really great spell. And when you can do that, it is pretty good. But the fact you have to wait to draw that card really makes it significantly worse. And you don't always have a great spell to get back either. Still, 
This is a decent enough rate for it to be a C. Next up, it's the Watcher in the Water, which for three generic and two blue is a 9-9 legendary Kraken at Mythic Rare. It enters a battlefield tapped with nine stun counters on it. Whenever you draw a card during an opponent's turn, create a 1-1 blue tentacle creature token. Whenever a tentacle you control dies, untap up to one target Kraken and put a stun counter on up to one target non-land permanent. A 5-mana 9-9 that spits out 1-1s is obviously amazing, but it enters tapped and heavily stunned, and if you don't have several ways to draw cards on your opponent's turn, you're not going to be getting those 1-1s either. If you can get those 1-1s, things start to look really good, because then you start adding to the board and making it tough for your opponent to attack or block, because if they kill those 1-1s, you suddenly have an untapped 9-9 that stuns whatever their best non-land permanent is. I think this probably needs a build around grade because even your typical blue deck probably isn't going to have enough ways to draw cards on your opponent's turn to make this worth it. So I think most of the time this is sadly just an F. But if you can find enough ways to draw cards on your opponent's turn, especially repeatable ways like that creature that can loot and things like that, the Watcher will turn into a nightmare for your opponent and perform more like a B+. And our last card is Willow Wind, which for four generic and a blue is a 3-4 elemental at common. It's got flying, and when it enters the battlefield, you scry two. The last time we saw a 5-mana 3-4 flyer that scryed two on ETB, it overperformed and was one of blue's better commons, and that wasn't even a set that had scry payoffs. So this is probably one of blue's best commons. I'm giving it a C+. So those are all the blue cards in Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. Tomorrow, I'll be back to talk about all the black cards. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of the set review, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to catch up on the other parts of the review, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.